Lunch is just half an hour away. In that half hour, I want to give you some food for thought in the form of five patterns. These should help you use jQuery more effectively. I selected these five from my work on jQuery UI and QUnit and other projects. To make them sticky, I came up with a few car and driving related analogies. You've already seen a few of those, but I also have a car joke. Did you hear about the new car that was made entirely out of trees? It was rejected because it wouldn't move. I also have a quiz for you. What is the most popular jQuery version on the jQuery CDN? Is it A, jQuery latest, B, uh, jQuery latest min, or C, jQuery 191 min? So who th here thinks it's A? No one? One? Who thinks it's B? One or two, and C? All right, keep that in mind. Well, we'll get to that later. Uh, Let's look at the first pattern. Write code like you spend fuel. I adapted this from Doug Nana's write code like you spend money. I like that a lot, so I put it into my, my car and driving theme. When low on fuel, we don't drive as fast as possible to get to the next gas station. But when the tank is full and we are in a hurry, we can drive a little faster. So how does that apply to JavaScript? Let me show you. In JavaScript, we have a choice when to run code. Before anything happens, on document ready, on window load, or what I usually recommend, the one down here, comment it as cool place. Like this is very different from document ready. It's usually a, the best choice for code to run if you don't want to block anything while the page is loading. But independent of what you're choosing, if you've got too much code running too early, it will slow down the loading of the page. How can we address that? I've got a few examples, and I want to start with a little demo. Um, let's see. So here in this demo, there's an autocomplete attached to this input. And if I start, start typing here, it suggests some names. And that also applies to this table here. Like Each of these inputs has autocomplete. That by itself is pretty unspectacular. That's like what you expect the autocomplete to work. But the special thing about this demo that uh, all of these autocomplete widgets actually initialize just in time, in the moment that I focus on one of these inputs. So if you imagine that the table is actually pretty big, has lots of rows, maybe multiple inputs in each column, lots of columns, then initializing all, all of those on page load might be terribly slow. So how does this just-in-time initialization work? In the simplest example, with just a single input, we can use the uh, one method that jQuery provides to bind just the focus event to this input, and then when this runs, it'll initialize the autocomplete. And since one will unbind the event handle automatically, this will run just once. So that, that works. It gets more interesting when we, when we are dealing with a lot of inputs, like in a big table. Here, event delegation uh, allows us to use a single event handle on the common element. So in this case, it would use the table element to bind this, this focus event using jQuery's on method and then match all the inputs that have the autocomplete class. So that's my marker to apply this widget. And the trick in this case is to actually remove this class so that this runs just once for each input and then the autocomplete is initialized. And since the selector won't match anymore, it'll, all the focus events uh, will be very effective, like will be very quick to filter out. So there's no, uh, even if this, if we actually don't actually can, we, we can't remove this event handler after since we don't necessarily know when all, all inputs are initialized, but we don't have to since this is very effective. We can do a very similar thing with date picker. The only difference to, uh, really for compared to autocomplete is that the date picker also shows up when we focus. So we can emulate that behavior by initializing the date picker and then immediately showing it. And since otherwise the code is pretty much the same, this code will just run once and then for the, um, the date pick itself takes over the, the focus event handling. If you look at the demo here, it, there's really no surprise. It's just uh, like a regular date picker, even though it's initialized just in time. We can also apply that principle to dialogues. Usually dialogues have some kind of a trigger that's used to open the dialogue. In this case, I use an anchor that points to the content of the dialogue, and then I use a little, uh, I use, uh, use the anchor's href attribute to find the dialog, hide it manually, 
and then when the, the trigger is clicked, I check if the dialog is already initialized. If so, open it. Otherwise, um, initialize it, which automatically opens it. And once more in this demo, it looks like a regular dialog, even though it uh, la uses lazy initialization. And the last one of these, uh, we can apply the same principle to form validation. This one is actually surprisingly easy, since um, when you submit a form and you click on the submit button, you want um, the, the submit event to be handled properly. But if you don't actually want to initialize the validation immediately and you don't know where the user starts interacting, um, this, when I put this together, I thought it might get tricky. But using jQuery's focus in, in event, which um, is very hard to actually use without jQuery, um, it gets pretty trivial since even clicking on the submit button will tr trigger the, the focus in event before the submit event so that we can initialize the validation, in this case using the jQuery validation plugin. So in the demo, uh, if I click on submit here, while there's currently only the focus in event bound to the form, um, triggering that event will bind the submit event and then the submit event actually handles the form submit. In the particular example here, since the form validation plugin itself uses event delegation, it only binds like three events to the form itself. In this case, it doesn't make too much sense. But if you're initializing stuff that actually has a lot more overhead, which is easy to imagine outside of this tiny demo, then that would be pretty useful as well. In addition to these demos, I want to show you an example of lazy initialization that I found on the actual site, not just a little demo. This is from a German IT news site. Uh, and instead of loading social widgets, which would like, make requests to at least three more, more than mains, probably more, uh, they int introduced an extra click. So in order to share something on Facebook, you actually have to activate this Facebook widget, and then you can share it on Facebook. And this is good for performance and for privacy, since you don't actually like, send requests to, to, these other, to these third party sites if you don't want to. And they, for convenience, they still provide an option to always load uh, some or all of these widgets in this little pop-up on the right. Which concludes the first pattern, write code like you spend fuel. Coming up next, write code like you don't know the road. Oops, sorry. Write code like you don't know the road. <coughs> this one is about the interaction between JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. It's common that we change some markup to allow some changes in CSS, which then breaks some brittle JavaScript code. I want to show this again with a simple demo. Here, this element, if I hover here, uh, it shows a handle, and I can drag this element using this handle. Pretty trivial, but uh, again, this is just for, for demo purposes. Uh, imagine what would happen when like, one change request of the, the other requires changes in the, in the markup here. It would probably break the underlying JavaScript, so we don't really want that. Uh, here's the underlying code. At the top, it's the HTML markup, and below, the JavaScript. And this currently uses the children methods to find the uh, handle container, so the element that, that's used to render the handle. And if we uh, were to wrap this, this handle in, inside another element for whatever styling purposes, it would break this JavaScript. In this case, we can just replace the children method with the find method to avoid that. And Doug Nina called these flexible and brittle methods. I like those terms, so I've kept those. And generally, the pref all, next all, closest, and find methods are more flexible than their counterparts. So if, if you have a choice in using these and you don't necessarily need to, for example, use children, then it's a good idea to actually stick with these flexible, me flexible methods. And for the given example, this is very easy to apply. You just replace the children method with the find method. If we were to change the markup now, the JavaScript would continue to work without changes. That's nice. Uh, the same principle applies to selectors as well. For example, in the context of event delegation, and we've already seen uh, that event delegation has lots of good uses. So in this case, where we want to bind the click handler to all uh, an uh, to all anchors that like point to Twitter, it's a good idea to use the more flexible selector. So the one that just matches the href 
So matches the, the domain. Since any anchor could have the class Twitter, maybe the markup wasn't updated properly. But if the, uh, the href actually changes, then it doesn't point to Twitter anymore. And it, it would be correct that this, this event delegation doesn't match anymore. And since click events happen very rarely, like you click, 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 and that's like three events that doesn't matter. So the performance overhead that this, the, more comp like the more flexible selector might have is ir irrelevant here. So write code like you don't know the road. Use flexible methods and selectors, which somewhat applies to the next pattern as well. Write code like you avoid traffic jams. Traffic jams are kind of like performance bottlenecks. If you always think about them like every day or every time you get into the car, you waste a lot of time and energy. But on the other hand, it's a good idea to avoid well-known rush hours. If you know that there's going to be traffic jam on your way to work, then you have a chance to address that early. When it comes to jQuery, there's a few traffic jams we can look out for. Usually anything involving like thousands of elements on a page, which is it is similar to having thousands of cars on, the, on this small road that will be slow. So uh, also doing lots of processing in events that happen very often, like mouse move, is also a bad idea. Like click is fine. We can do a lot of stuff there. On mouse move, we have to be very conservative. Occasionally, it's less obvious. Here's some jQuery code that creates a list of items, which looks pretty innocent. It sets text and data for each list item. Then add each item is added to a jQuery object, which is then added to the page using jQuery's append method. So it's just one DOM operation, but why does it take more than two seconds for 400 items, which is really not that much? This is a good opportunity to use a profiler. When I ran into this problem, I could already somewhat tell which part of my code was responsible, and it actually looked kind of like this. I couldn't really tell why it was so slow, though. So I had, instead of these time calls that I had on the previous slide, I um, used the prof console profile methods and profile and. So these two here. And then I just went back to Chrome and ran the code again to look at the profile. And here's a screenshot of Chrome's flame graph of that profile. In this case, this is pretty interactive. So just looking at it like that, it's not very interesting yet. But we can hover. Uh, pretty much all of these bars to, to get details. And since my code, which is the anonymous function in this case, was uh, calling the add method, that's where, what I ho hovered first. And Chrome showed uh, something like this. So here we can see the aggregated total time is like almost two seconds. So that looks like it accounts for the runtime that we're looking at. So something is going on with the add method. And it seems to be responsible here. But the aggregated self time is just six milliseconds. So the app method itself doesn't really seem to do anything interesting. And in the graph, if you look at this, the, the method next to that, where you can only see somewhat cut off sizzle, is actually called sizzle.unique sort. So I looked at that next. And the aggregated total time is pretty much the same here, like almost two seconds. Aggregated self time, 65 milliseconds far away from two seconds, but much more than the six milliseconds. So I figured I'm onto something here. Long story short, when, when digging into this, I learned that this isn't actually a new issue and has been in some form around for a long time. And several other jQuery methods had this problem as well. But they actually got fixed around jQuery 1.5. And in the release blog post, there were these graphs. So here in blue, uh, you see the 144 performance and 15 in green for the children method. There were also, was also a graph for the next method and pref. And all three of these got a lot faster. And what these had in common was that they all called unique sort, just like add still does. And unique sort sorts selected elements in DOM order. And if you think about that, like if I just create a jQuery object to gather some elements to append somewhere, Sorting them in DOM order makes no sense. So in this case, it's uh, while add is, is still slow and still has to sort for other reasons, uh, we can work around it by actually not using add at all. In this case, using a plain array. So instead of the jQuery object, I assign a plain array to the items variable, and then use the items push method to gather these items. And jQuery deals with appending an array of DOM elements or jQuery objects just fine. So then. We don't actually have to change anything else. 
and this runs in less than 60 milliseconds, at least on my machine. So that was pretty, pretty nice. Uh, again, write code like you avoid traffic jams, which uh, in this case, the answer could be found in JavaScript. In other cases, we have to look a little further, which brings us to combine tools like you would park and write. As we heard, heard earlier to some degree already, uh, jQuery, jQuery pioneered a lot of new APIs. And a lot of them are now available, available in the browser without li libraries, just using JavaScript, for example, like query selector all or class list. One particular new API got exposed uh, via CSS transitions. Since jQuery animations tend to be pretty slow on mobile devices like this one, CSS transitions are quite valuable there. They don't really replace jQuery, as I'm going to show, but combining both is very powerful. I'm going to start with a little demo again. This here, imp oh, there. This here implements a custom tooltip, which shows up on hover of any of these elements and, shows, and like, then fades out again. So there's like a simple fade in and fade out transition. With jQuery, we would just use the fade in and fade out methods, or fade toggle maybe, but since that doesn't really look good on mobile, um, we want to use CSS transitions instead. So let's look at options for implementing that. Here's the CSS from that demo, like the entire CSS for this custom tooltip. Uh, most of that is just like general setup to make the, to style the tooltip. The interesting parts are the last few lines where it said opacity zero for the tool, regular tooltip, uh, specify a transition, in, the, in this case to apply only for opacity and then specify a separate class called tooltip visible, which sets opacity to one. Let's look at the JavaScript that makes use of this CSS. This is pretty much the entire JavaScript used for this custom tooltip. Um, at first, I create an element that I add the tooltip class to and then append that to the body. And then I bind mouse enter and mouse leave events to all the anchors that have a title attribute on the page and then like, do some stuff to make the tool to work. So the, we, we, I read the t title attribute from the anchor that gets hovered, remove that on the anchor itself so that the native tool to, uh, disappears or doesn't show up anymore, uh, and then set the text on, the, on our custom tooltip element, position it relative to the mouse event, and finally add this tooltip visible class. And on mouse leaf, all we have to do is reset the title so that we can read it again and remove this class. So like mouse enter, add class, mouse leave, remove class. That's really all there is on the interaction with the CSS right now. And this does the trick to actually uh, show and hide the element using the, um, the opacity transition. This works, but we can also control the transition directly from JavaScript without writing any CSS. And in this uh, same tooltip example, which visually looks just the same, so I'm not going to show the demo again, uh, it's using the transit plugin. So I removed the transition from, from this, the, the few uh, lines in, of CSS and uh, instead used this transition method. And also removed adding and removing of the tooltip visible class. Instead, I call this transition method uh, where it specifies the properties that I want to transition. So opacity one, opacity zero. This also in the first call sets the queue option to false to achieve the same non-queuing behavior as CSS transitions. If you ever like, implemented a custom tooltip using just jQuery animations and like hovered between elements, you might have seen where it like, queues up the show and hide animation that looks pretty silly. So we don't want them to queue up. So which one should you pick? Like doing it using a transit plugin or some other method directly from JavaScript or specify them in CSS? might be just a matter of preference. Like if you actually prefer, like if you consider these transitions part of the styling, then specifying them in CSS might be a good choice. If you're used to using jQuery animations and want to keep the same style, then specifying that in JavaScript might make more sense. It might be a matter of control. So if you actually want to queue up multiple transitions, then you can't do that with just CSS. There's no queue control. So this transit plugin gives, gives that to you. Another thing to consider, fallbacks. When desired, they're really easy to do with a transit plugin. All you have to do is check if, uh, 
if there's support for transitions. And if not, then alias the uh, create an alias to the transition methods to the jQuery's animate method. That way, any any property that jQuery anim can animate, um, you can still uh, use. You can still call the transition method on with opacity since that's something that jQuery supports. The thing is, with CSS transitions, you don't need, necessarily need them since they actually fall back to just instantly changing styles, which is really good enough most of the time. You don't necessarily need to fall back for CSS transitions. Some animations are impossible to implement with CSS, like page scroll. Got the same demo again, where now I'm going to click on this button, and you can see that it scrolls down the page and does that with an animation. And this is something that's impossible to implement with CSS. For that, we can still use jQuery, where we actually have to select both the HTML and the body element, since uh, body is what works in most browsers, and HTML is the only thing that works in old IE. Uh, the annoying thing is then this callback will get called twice. Um, there's, there's a little workaround to, to have a single callback. Uh, we can use jQuery's promise method, which, if called without any arguments, will, will give, us, give us access to the animation queue. And if we bind a callback using the then method of that promise object, we get a single callback that runs just twice, uh, just once. This is something that you can do in general if you're using jQuery animations on multiple elements and you want a single callback. That brings us to the fifth and last pattern, customize widgets like customizing a car. These days, you can pick much more than just the color when buying a new car. And even if it's new or new used, you can also customize stuff yourself, like you could replace the rims or attach a cool spoiler. How does this apply to JavaScript? For example, jQuery UI widgets come with a selection of themes. It's like picking the car color, picking the theme. You can pick one that comes close and then adjust some details manually. So if on your project you've got a designer and he wants to, things to look a certain way, you can actually uh, customize uh, existing widgets to get close to what, you, what he wants. Let's look at a demo of customized widgets here using jQuery UI tabs and date picker. This here is, uh, well, there's a tab widget and with a date, uh, inline date picker. Nothing spectacular yet. Um, this is using the original theme provided by Theme Roller. It's called Flick. In this next demo, I've customized, I'm using the same widgets, and I just added some CSS to customize th these. So um, I made the tab adders stand out and added icons. I moved some spacing on the date picker to match the tabs, and all that took just a few lines of extra CSS. If you go back to the previous one, you can see that um, it's somewhat subtle, but that's often what visual design is all about. Uh, but then again, this is just a demo, so I'd like to show you some actual customized widgets. This is from My Balsamic, a tool for creating mockups. Uh, here is a customized menu with icons on the left and some shortcuts to change project styles. So in this little booklet with the icon at the bottom of each, if you click on that, the menu opens. And if you click any of the icons at the bottom of that menu, then it'll change the style of that booklet. They also use custom tooltip. So where it says launch, launch prototype at the top right, the other three icons also have uh, this custom tooltip. Like the positioning is customized and the styling. They've got this dialog which uh, uses tabs where it's just two tab headers, but they embed it into the dialog header, which saves some screen estate, and I think it looks nice too. And last one from, from their side, the access slider. This is a regular jQuery UI slider, customized to include these labels, where it says like uh, private and website and so on. So these are examples of custom widgets that you can fit into your design, while you benefit from their great user experience and accessibility. If you don't like the theme roller themes and don't want to build your own, um, there's, there's more, like Widgmo provides several good themes. Here's Aristo, at the bottom half, and or this midnight theme. I've got more widgets, more themes. Uh, all that to say, unless building cars or widgets is your business, you shouldn't build widgets from scratch, just like you wouldn't build a car from scratch, since you would waste a lot of time and probably miss a lot of details. Which brings us to the end, so it's time to resolve the quiz. 
and uh, it's good to see that um, pretty much all of you guessed right. The number one, um, pretty much all guessed C, which is the right answer. The sad thing is the other ones actually placed two and three. Uh, if you're running a website that uses jQuery latest, you should probably update that. Uh, by the way, the top file here, 19min, had within, uh, for January, 1.3 mil, sorry, 1.3 billion hits using 43 terabytes of bandwidth. With that out of the way, I'd like to quickly recap what we looked at. Write code like you spend fuel. Plan ahead, spend as necessary, and keep a reserve. Write code like you don't know the road. Be flexible, avoid brittle methods and selectors. Write code like you avoid traffic jams, avoid JavaScript rush hours, use a profiler when you run into unexpected bottlenecks. Combine tools like you would park and write. Make use of CSS transitions, combine them with jQuery. And finally, customize widgets like customizing a car. Don't build widgets from scratch when you can customize them. Here are contact details and links to slides and resources. I hope we can keep them up for a few minutes. And we have like three and a half minutes for questions. <laughs>